Good afternoon. Welcome back to Global Media Network, LLC. Passionate World Talk Radio is a wholly owned subsidiary of GMN, LLC. Our motto is educate, enlighten, entertain. And today on Lest We Forget, we'll be talking about Manifest Destiny. And our host, Lisa Skinner, will start us off. Hello, everybody. Thanks for being with us here today. We appreciate your valuable time. And we have got a really fascinating topic to talk about. How many of you have ever even heard of Manifest Destiny? Well, I hadn't. (laughs) So I had to research it. But once I figured out what Manifest Destiny really was, I had an unbelievable aha moment and told myself, this makes total sense. I guess in theory, I did know that this was what was happening throughout history. I just didn't know that's what it was called. So we're going to explain all that to you today. And it's really, really eye-opening. So Manifest Destiny was actually a phrase coined back in 1845 with the idea that the United States is destined by God. And that's what the advocates believed to expand its dominion and spread democracy and capitalism across the entire North American continent. So this ideology was born in the USA. The philosophy drove 19th century U.S. territorial expansion and was used to justify the forced removal of Native Americans and other groups from their homes. The rapid expansion of the United States intensified the issue of slavery as new states were added to the Union, leading to the outbreak of the Civil War. See how it's all tying in. So, the U.S. population exploded in the first half of the 19th century from around 5 million people in 1800 to more than 23 million people by 1850. That was only 50 years that it went from 5 million to 23 million. This is all part of manifest destiny. Such rapid growth, as well as two economic depressions, I don't know if you were aware, but there was a depression in 1819. There was a depression in 1839 would drive millions of Americans in search of new land and new opportunities. So President Thomas Jefferson kicked off the country's westward expansion in 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase. And that it, uh, the through that Louisiana Purchase, the U.S. acquired 828,000 square miles And that nearly doubled the size of the United States. In addition to sponsoring the Western expedition of Lewis and Clark of 1805 to 1807, Jefferson also set his sights on Spanish Florida, a process that was finally concluded in 1819 under President James Monroe. In 1823, Monroe invoked Manifest Destiny, when he spoke before Congress to warn European nations not to interfere with America's westward expansion. He threatened that any attempt by Europeans to colonize the American continents would be seen as an act of war. This this policy of an American sphere of influence and of non-intervention of European affairs became known, we probably all heard this term, it became known as the Monroe Doctrine. So after 1870, 
This would be used as a rationale for the U.S. intervention in Latin America. Then, cries for the re-annexation of Texas increased after Mexico, having won its independence from Spain, they passed a law suspending U.S. immigration into Texas in 1830. Nobody's coming into Texas. Nonetheless, there were still more Anglo settlers in Texas than Hispanic ones. And in 1836, after Texas won its own independence, its new leaders sought to join the United States. The administrations of both Andrew Jackson and Martin Van Buren resisted such calls, fearing both war with Mexico and opposition from Americans who believed calls for annexation were linked with the desire to, what? To expand slavery in the Southwest. But John Tyler, who won the presidency in 1840, was determined to proceed with the annexation. And we know, because it's history, what? That happened. An agreement concluded in April 1844 made Texas eligible for admission as a U.S. territory and possibly later as one or more states. Despite opposition to this agreement in Congress, the pro-annexation candidate James K. Polk won the 1844 election and Tyler was then able to push the bill through and sign it before he left office. By the time Texas was admitted to the Union as a state in December of 1845, the idea that the United States must inevitably expand westward all the way to the Pacific Ocean had taken form. I mean, (laughs) had taken firm hold among people from different regions, classes, and political persuasions. The phrase manifest destiny, which emerged as the best known expression of this mindset, first appeared in an editorial published in the July-August 1845 issue of the Democratic Review. In it, the writer criticized the opposition that still lingered against the annexation of Texas, urging national unity on behalf of the fulfillment of our manifest destiny to overspread the continent allotted by Providence for the free development of our yearly multiplying millions. As the phrase also appeared in a nearly identical context in a July 1845 article in the New York Morning News, its originator is believed to be John O'Sullivan, who was the editor of both the Democratic Review and the Morning News at the time. That December, another Morning News article mentioned Manifest Destiny in reference to the Oregon Territory. Another new frontier over which the United States was eager to assert its dominion. In 1842, they uh, signed a treaty between Great Britain and the United States, partially resolved the question of where to draw the Canadian border, but left open the question of the Oregon Territory, which stretched from the Pacific coast to the Rocky Mountains over an area including what is now Oregon, Idaho, Washington State, and most of British Columbia. Polk, who happened to be an ardent proponent of Manifest Destiny, had won the election with the slogan, 54, 40, or fight. This was a reference to the potential northern boundary of Oregon as latitude 54 and 40, and called U.S. claims to Oregon clear and unquestionable questionable in his inaugural address. But as president, Polk wanted to get the issue resolved so that the United States could move on to acquiring California from, at the time, it was owned by Mexico. 
In mid-1846, his administration agreed to a compromise where, by, Oregon would be split along the 49th parallel, narrowly avoiding a crisis with Britain. So in a very short period of time, based on these facts, we expanded the entire continent very, very quickly. And this is the ideology of manifest destiny. By the time Oregon, the Oregon question was settled, the United States had entered into all-out war with Mexico, driven by the spirit of manifest destiny and territorial expansion, which is what it was all about. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which ended the Mexican-American War in 1848, added an additional 525,000 square miles of U.S. territory, including all or parts of what is now California, Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, and Wyoming. So despite the lofty idealism of manifest destiny, which was, again, the rapid territorial expansion over the first half of the 19th century, resulted not only in war with Mexico, but in the dislocation and brutal mistreatment of Native Americans, Hispanic and other European occupants of the territories now being occupied by the United States. The U.S. expansion also fueled the growing debate over slavery by raising the pressing question of whether new states being admitted to the Union would allow slavery or not. And that was the conflict that eventually led to the infamous Civil War. Lillian, I'm going to turn it over to you, and you can take it from there. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we all know that the Dred Scott decision came very soon after, meaning that a gentleman had taken the wagon train out west, I believe it was to Kansas, and he Kansas was not a slave state. Incidentally, it was one of the few states that was split so according to where you lived in Kansas, on the upper part, no slavery. On the southern part, slavery. So you can see that the United States was beginning to rethink whether or not they did indeed have the right to take slaves into the new expansion. However, manifest destiny, although it's coined, by the United States in the 19th century, you might wonder where these markers and their genes came from. And under the old name known as colonialism, the four primary European countries who also believe and manifest destiny, oh, I can see your hands up, were Spain, Portugal, France, and England. And in their own terms, they were looking for to assert their God, which was Roman Catholicism or Protestantism, depending on which end of the spectrum you were at, into other countries. And it did not bother them to wipe out the indigenous people whether in Canada, whether in South America, whether in Africa, Australia. Think about it. And today, Manifest Destiny has a new name. It's called politicians. The 21st century politicians who are pulling the same behavior in setting up colonies on the moon and on Mars. I'm sure you are paying attention to the current news saying, we're running out of ore. We're running out of minerals. We're running out of trees and water. Well, 
we run out of continents to go to on this planet and we can't get to the excess water that's underneath the core or the crust of this planet. So we need to go out to the moon and we need to go out to Mars and claim those planets for us. And it's not for the indigenous Indians. And there's great debate as to who will get there first. Whether it will be the Chinese or the Russians. India's not too far behind. And so that begs the question, who will come next? Just put it this way. The United States has run through their Nazi scientists. They're all dead now. So they don't have anybody to help them really spread their manifest destiny into outer space. But there is one other technological advance that may play a very large part in manifest or colonialism destiny, and that is artificial intelligence. Or as I look at it, in the beginning, God made man in his own image. And then somewhere in the 21st century, man made artificial intelligence slash machines in their own image. Think about it. Robots look like miniature men, not women. I find that very interesting. Maybe they feel like putting the bumps on the chest is a little too advanced, even for their technicians. Who knows? But it's always a male. Speaking of which, have you ever seen a female alien? I digress. Anyway, with the artificial intelligence, Isaac Asimov wrote books back in the 1930s and 40s, and he created robots. And along the way for his science fiction, he created seven rules for robots. And one of them was not to kill man. And one of the others was that he would not cross the boundary and wed a human woman. So what's the first thing our Congress and Senate has passed through is that robots slash artificial intelligence will not be allowed to have access to nuclear plants and or the red button that will signal a Holocaust from the atomic bomb, which I find interesting because all the scientists tell us is that we're importing data into these machines, not personalities. But it seems to me that making a machine or artificial intelligence in our own image means we are certainly giving them our prejudices, our bias, and our behavior, whether you want it or not. A machine studies you. A machine copies you. So whatever you are doing, that machine will also do. I think the only thing we're missing at the moment is a mechanical snake or a robot snake to crawl into and entice the machine to clip a can of oil from the tree of knowledge to make them that much more powerful. Think about it. You have artificial intelligence who maybe in six months from now think they're smarter than man. And then maybe in another month or two down the line, they decide, well, look what man has done throughout the whole history. Even cavemen had manifest destiny. If you look into the ancient reports, they were a nomad society that hunted and gathered along the way. So when they scared off all the game from that one particular area, where do you think they went? They went to another mountain. And they hunted until the game was scarce and they went to another mountain. And along the way, they killed anybody who got in their way because they believed 
that the mother herself, which was the deity prehistoric man worship, made them stronger and bolder, and they were entitled to that land in which these people were living. Think about it. Think about what's happening in Europe. Putin wants to reclaim all the territory that once made up Russia. And he's going to be using Ukraine as an example. And when he finally diminishes Ukraine, he'll move on to the next Russian country that has formally split itself out from the previous Soviet Union. So he is not calling it manifest destiny. He's saying they had no right to separate from us and become independent. Therefore, my God has told me it's okay to go out and kill men, women, and children, take no prisoners, separate the children from their parents, train them up to what I want. And along the way, it's okay for me to make an invincible army of AI and machines who will not question my decisions, but go out and take what I want. You're wondering where the United States got all these ideas from? That's where the United States got all their ideas from, from the people who originally colonized them. Why did Europe come over here in the first place? Well, in Europe, they ran out of trees. They ran out of drinkable water. They ran out of food. Sound interesting? Their economy was done on the skids. There were too many people occupying a smaller space. If you ask the typical American who came over here, what were they promised in Roosevelt's turn was a chicken in every pot and two cars in the driveway. We haven't changed in our attitude or our belief section. It doesn't matter whether you're fighting for a Christian God or a Protestant God or a Muslim God or a Jewish God. God is God, is somebody who we created to put on top of us. Just the same way that people back in the old days in the 17 and 16 and 1500s had to create kings and queens and emperors and dictators because it was believed if they were stronger, they would be able to vanquish our enemies and they would take better care of us. Do you honestly think you're being taken care of better since the manifest destiny of the United States and the colonialism that has persisted until the 21st century? Although news stories are now saying that the UK, especially England, is getting a terrific backlash from all the Caribbean and Mediterranean islands they originally colonized. They don't want to be part of England's manifest destiny slash colonialism anymore. They want their freedom to be an independent country without somebody else calling the shots politically or economically. So we'll leave you with Betsy Wurzel, who will make comments about what both Lisa Skinner and I have presented today. Betsy. Hi, everyone. Uh, my uh, phone dropped, uh, my internet dropped while Lisa was speaking. I also did not know the term manifest destiny. I had to look it up and I went on YouTube and listened to some uh, YouTube uh, history documentaries and, you know, I. I'm 65, so I don't remember my history and my geography, uh, but I do remember learning about, you know, the Alamo and Louisiana Purchase. What was missing from the history was the truth, was the genocide of the Native Americans. 
when I, I was like stunned, okay, when I heard about this manifest destiny, everyone thinks that their uh, God tells them, you know, conquer this land, conquer that land, kill, kill this person, kill that person. I might offend some people, but you know what? I'm a Jersey girl, so I just say it like it is. Um, and I did miss some of what you said, Lisa, but, you know, there's the purchase of Alaska and Hawaii. Think about it, folks. We took Mexico's land, and I think now they might want it back. Um, so we really can't complain about the people from South America coming over because it was their land to begin with. And I was thinking about this manifest destiny and I was thinking about Europe. Now my mother's parents were kicked off their land. Maybe it was considered manifest destiny back then, but it was the programs. Yeah. They were Jewish. They got kicked off their land for being Jewish. We kicked the Native Americans off their land and the Mexicans out. Are we any better? No, we're not. And as Lisa had and uh, Lillian had said in previous episodes, where did Hitler learn this from? From America. Now that's mind boggling. And I'm going to digress here because last week when we were talking about the boarding schools, I forgot to say something, uh, and the adoption. They were taken away, these Indian uh, Native American children from their parents because their houses were crowded because they had multi-generational uh, people living there. Well, you know what? My mom grew up in the Bronx and she lived with her grandparents and her parents. My mother didn't have her own room. She shared it with her brother. Should they have been taken away? If they were Native Americans, they would have been taken away from their parents. It's not right what happened. And I just had to bring that up. And, you know, the artificial intelligence, it's, um, <laughs> it's twofold for me. It's exciting, but it's a little scary. Technology in the wrong hands, folks, is going to be dangerous. This is dangerous territory. I was watching uh, some programs. Uh, and the criminals, and they use technology now to steal, to scam, to hurt people. Can you imagine with this artificial intelligence getting a phone call and you think it's your child, your grandchildren saying they need money? Can you imagine um, a AI of you and they're, you're saying something, but it's not you, it's the computer that, that's doing it? and you're saying something completely out of your character, this is gonna get people into trouble. If this falls into the wrong hands, it's gonna be a problem. And I believe also that whoever goes to Mars and settles there, <clears throat> it's gonna be a problem. Um, if it's again in the wrong hands. And you know everything is okay if it's handled correctly. But when we push the Native Americans out, and I think they got the wrong deal, definitely in this country, we pushed them out of their land. Can you imagine, folks, I want you to think about this. Imagine you formed the land. You were there for years and years. And someone just comes and says, I want it. I want your land. Now get out. Uh, or you're going to be killed. And they killed people. And, you know, you had the gold rush. How many people were killed doing that? And um, just, you know, going out west. I guess maybe they went out west for a better life, some of them. Um, a lot of them were farmers and, you know, they had families. They wanted to start anew. But unfortunately, excuse me, <coughs> the Native Americans got shafted. No other way to say it. They got, they got the shaft. And... Everyone thinks their God is on their side. And we really have to put uh, things in perspective. We need to bring back our humanity and realize we are more alike than we are different. Forget the skin color. Forget all that. You know, I worked with children in a preschool for 13 years. 
they don't care about skin color. They don't care if the child has a disability. They just want someone to play with. It's when the adults open their mouth and start poisoning the children's mind, that's when they start the, the prejudice. And prejudice is handed down from generation to generation. And we need to stop the hate. And um, that's what I have to say. Thank you for listening. Lisa, do you have anything else you would like to add? I think between the three of us, we covered a lot of really, really compelling thoughts and ideas. Yeah. So um, the only thing that I would add is why have Americans and those before us in European countries always been so obsessed with owning land? And I think that everything we talked about really circles back to that. It's because land symbolizes opportunity to generations, starting with the colonists, and it represents opportunities, like Lillian said, that they never had before. And if you look back in history, every single move that was made to conquer land was really built on this premise. So um, we're going to continue to see history repeating itself. And and I think <laughs> true to what Lillian um, used as an example we're going to see manifest destiny expand all the way to maybe the moon and to Mars. They're not finished yet because it's just man's innate determination to conquer and own what they want. And I don't know if there's anything that's going to stop this from happening. Nothing has yet. Until maybe we get to the last scene of the Planet of the Apes movie, where <laughs> those astronauts who survived thought that they were living on a different planet until the very last scene and realized, saw the Statue of Liberty half broken in the sand, realizing that he wasn't on a different planet. He was in on earth and we had destroyed ourselves and then the apes through evolution came back superior to us is that what it's going to take before we break the cycle of habit that we have been displaying for thousands and thousands and thousands of years i hope i'm not around to see that thank you well, if you remember, if you saw most of the Planet of the Apes, they start resembling the man of uh, which they try to control. So it seems to be in our ape slash human genes. Thank you very much, Lisa and Betsy, for joining us in Manifest Destiny. Next week, we're going to do a review and any other additional material we would like to bring to the table about the indigenous Indians. There is so much going on today compared to what was so much going on in the 18 and 1900s that we cannot encompass all this content in just one month. However, from time to time, we will do reviews of the topics. Your call to action, ladies and gentlemen, is to let us know what in particular you would like to delve in further on the topic of the U.S. and the indigenous Indians. Just remember, Columbus called them Indians because he thought he found the route to the Spice Islands, which was India. So he thought he was finding Indians from India. And that's why they're called Indians today just in case you were not taught that in history class. We wanna thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. 
you can hear this all over again at youtube.com forward slash PWR network underlying PW talk radio, facebook.com forward slash passionate world radio, also on twitter.com forward slash passionate world radio, and on our website, passionate world talk radio.com. If you have any opinions, suggestions, comments, you can contact Lisa Skinner at www.dement I'm sorry dementia whisperer one at gmail.com that's my email address sorry about that it's okay we get involved in our work ladies and gentlemen yes. <laughs> Betsy yes my email is Sloan S-L-O-A-N Betsy 31 at gmail.com I do want to add a comment Lillian and Lisa, and I just want to tell the audience, people in the United States thought that the Native Americans were inferior. And when you tell a lie long enough, people believe it. And to treat people like they're subhuman. The Nazis did it to the Jews and other um, ethnic um, origins, uh, people. So hate brings hate. And I am, I guess, the child of the 60s and 70s. Let's bring on the love. Let's love up on each other. And that's what I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. And you can reach me at PWR Network, LLC, at gmail.com. And one more thing for you to think about. Recently, in the news, the state of Texas has passed a law saying that slavery and and bias history won't be taught in their state anymore. Manifest Destiny, Indigenous Indian, and Slavery with the Blacks, what do you think? Is that a shade too close to what Lisa and I and Betsy spoke about today? Think about it and let us know. Thank you all very much for listening. And remember, Please keep listening. Thank you.